Welcome to the channel. I got my brother Christ Rob here with us today, and we're talking about the Old Testament law. What is the Old Testament um, covenant? What is the Old Covenant? What are the differences between the Old and New Covenant? And what are the relationships between the Old and New Covenant? And so we're going to go ahead and just dive right in and talk about it and look at some passages of Scripture that we can consider when it comes to the Old Covenant. Um, there seems to be a lot of, I mean, really, really, there's been like sex, like different parts mm -hmm. of Christianity where, where groups tend to really be into like obeying the law, obey, obedience. Yeah. And I think sometimes it can be, it can be healthy. Obeying God is healthy, For sure. but it be, it's dangerous when you are misplacing it and trying to put stipulations on people in Christ. What are your thoughts on like, yeah. just, uh, just right now, like as the church, just the church in general with people who trying to figure out the law, yeah. how to obey God. What are your thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I think, I think, you know what? I really think there's, because there's been such a, a biblical illiteracy in this day and age that people don't really study the Old Testament like that, you know? People aren't going back. People are referencing, like, the popular ones. If they do go to the Old Testament, it's the Davids, you know? Oh, you're David and Goliath. And, yeah. you know, they're, they're placing themselves in th those situations, but they're not necessarily studying it in context or even uh, thinking through, like, some of the covenants that God has made. And so when people go back, they see all these commandments and, and the, the effects that it had and they read it and they're like yo like what, what are we doing nowadays they're trying to they're trying to figure out how to place and I think it's just because yeah there's been like a biblical illiteracy and we need to go back and study it in context right in, a, in relation to what's been revealed right uh, scripture right uh, there's a progressive revelation like to God with scripture that he reveals himself one way as time progresses he reveals new things right um, which is where we get into hey there's a there's a covenant over here but then there's new covenants that come into play and so um, I think it's cool that people are like diving into that stuff um, because it's pressing people to actually think through that you know not just the, the typical hey I'm just going to live my life however believe yeah. in Jesus but it's like hey we actually got to study scripture right because people are, are looking into it they're coming to these conclusions and yeah we got to address them man but yeah, yeah. Um, my, my, um, so we, Rob and I, we both went to uh, Grand Canyon University just at different times and our professor, my Old Testament professor was Dr. Diffie. Same. Yeah. And yeah, shouts out Diffie. He, uh, he, when I met with him about pursuing seminary and pursuing mm -hmm. furthering my education, like a doctoral school, eventually he was, he was adamant about, you need to get a degree in Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know if I want to get a degree in Old Testament because um, I just have more of an interest in the New Testament. Not, I mean, it's God's word. Old yeah, Testament is God's sure. word. I love, I love Amen. the Old Testament. Amen. But I just have a more of a, a draw towards the New Testament. Yeah. But the New, te the Old Testament is two thirds of our Bible. Yeah. I remember him telling me like the, the Old Testament is two thirds of our Bible. And there's not a lot of like Old Testament scholars. Mm -hmm. There's way more New Testament scholars than there are sure. Old Testament. Yeah. And that that's probably because it's uh, there's not as many. There's only 27 books. Yeah. And there's a large amount more than yeah. uh, 39, 39 in the old, 27 in the new, right? And you gotta yeah, yeah and you gotta filter through all that. You know, connect things, put them in its historical place. Super disconnected, right? The New Testament yeah, is a lot closer than. Then the Old Testament, right? When you're thinking books like Job, right? The Pentateuch, that's like far removed compared to like the New Testament too. So there's a lot less work that has to go into that. And even the way like we even do textual yeah. criticism when we talk about like the Old Testament, we usually start with the New yeah. Testament and work our way back because we start with like the, the Septuagint, mm -hmm. which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of work done in the New Testament, sure. but there's not as much. And there, there's, I mean, thousands of years, there's a lot of work done in the Old Testament, yeah. but there's just more in the New Testament. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want we're talking about the Old Covenant mm -hmm. and the New Covenant. Mm -hmm. What is the Old Covenant? Give us, give us, your understanding of yeah. what the old covenant is. Yeah. Um, yeah, just yeah, go ahead and go yeah. for that. I think, I think it's important to talk about the fact that God interacts with people in covenants, right? That within, within scripture, right? He creates humanity, right? He creates Adam and Eve. 
they mess up. God has a plan to redeem it. And through that, he establishes covenants with people um, to partner with them in this pro plan of redemption, right? And with that, these covenants that he makes, we definitely want to pay attention to them. Um, they can get removed like within our context because, you know, people make promises all the time. People break their promises. We hear about it left and right. Sometimes we might have broken our promises, right? So it just gets far removed uh, from us. But when we study like what a covenant is, right? It was an agreement between two parties, right? Um, and it's more than just like a promise. It was like, no, this, like what they did, right? We think of uh, the Abrahamic covenant yeah, where God made a covenant with Abraham. They split an animal in two and right it's in a dream god walks through the animal in, in a in a fire kind of deal and really when you study that what it symbolizes is like hey if we break this covenant let us be like this animal split in two so it was more than just like a regular promise it was like yo my life is on the line like i'm on the line um, with this agreement so but but god is willing to, to partner with fallen humanity and his redemptive work, right? And it's through these covenants. And we see that there's a, a progression that happens. When the first covenant starts, right, there's a debate about that, um, like with Adam or was it before like creation, stuff like that. But when we think of old covenant, the main one that comes to people's mind, right, is the Mosaic covenant, yeah. right? Uh, the law of Moses, when God had brought the people out of Israel through, uh, through the Exodus, right? And then he takes them to Mount Sinai and enters into a covenant with the nation of Israel, right? And then from uh, from there, there's stipulations like, hey, you know, I will be your God, you will be my people if you obey, right? And there's there comes with that all kinds of commandments that they have to obey, all different types of laws um, with that entrance into this covenant. Um, and so, so yeah, covenant is an agreement between two parties that's marked by obedience uh, to this covenant, right? This uh, disobedience to this covenant has some major ratifications for that, yeah. and uh, and uh, yeah, and God God still continues to operate like that, and He's operating within covenants even today. So there were um, yeah, so Rob's right as far as God, He's a covenantal God, mm -hmm. and it's different even if we think about like marriage, like um, it's different where. Marriage is not meant to just be this social agreement, yeah. but it's meant to be a covenant that's not supposed to be broken. Mm -hmm. um, it's a more of a serious term, and we mm -hmm. don't tend to use that type of language in our culture today. Um, but there are stipulations when it comes to the old covenant, the old, the old, and we're and we're specifically really talking about that Mosaic covenant. Yeah. And when we say Mosaic covenant, it's important for you to, to think about Mosaic means Moses, mm -hmm. Moses the covenant God made with Moses on Mount Sinai for all the people of Israel. So that's what we mean when we're talking about old covenant, specifically the Mosaic covenant, but there are stipulations and you kind of mentioned some of them, the stip uh, that, um, that if you disobey me, you're cutting yourself oh. off. Um, what are some, what are some stipulations as far as like, what are the categories mm -hmm. um, in the, so there's 613 laws. Mm -hmm. What are the categories that these laws, these stipulations, what are the, some of the categories speak yeah. to some of that? Yeah. So, so within the um, Mosaic covenant that we see, God enters into covenant. He starts off first with the 10 commandments, right? Which is, which, you know, Christians today typically refer to that as like the, the moral law, right? Mm -hmm. um, how we, yeah, how we interact with God, morality. Um, then as you dive deeper into, you know, the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, um, all that numbers, um, you start to see that there's um, laws on how they interact with each other within their nation that, or within their land that they're to possess. So people label that the civil law, um, right? And then there's ordinance ceremonies that are in place on how you're to uh, reflect on this covenant, right? There's uh, Passover, right? Uh, feast. There, there's all kinds of ceremonies that are in there. So it gets categorized as a ceremonial law. Um, so those are the three distinctions that we typically see within that. Yeah. And that. so uh, Rob's right as far as when he's talking about the, the different categories, we got the moral law, we got the, the civil or judicial law, and then we got the ceremonial laws. What was... In order to get into the covenant, mm -hmm. in order to be a part as a man, in order to get into the covenant, what what needed to be done in order to be a part of this covenant mm -hmm. family yeah. of Israel? Yeah, well, yeah, you had to be circumcised. That was, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially yeah, if you were a grown man at that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you had to get circumcised. That that was the entrance into the covenant. That was a, a a sign that you were a part of this covenant. Is that you were circumcised, right? And, and that comes from like. So we were talking about specifically like the the Mosaic covenant, but that's a that's a that's part of the yeah. the. 
Abrahamic or <laughs> Abrahamic covenant yeah. that comes into the Mosaic covenant. Yeah. So sometimes there are there are stipulations that enter into covenants yeah. Yeah. that God continues. Yeah. And the and you mentioned it previously too, talking about how the Bible, how God works through covenants, is progressive. Mm-hmm. How he progressive, we get like the Adam. You, um, the covenant with Adam, then we get the covenant with Noah, we get the covenant with Abraham, then we get the covenant with Moses. But is, do you think, and before we get into how the relationship, the relationship between the old covenant and the new covenant, do you think that there are any other covenants that are going to come about if God is progressive in his re- revelation? Do you think that there are any more covenants that we should expect? Uh, no, not, not for, uh, not for like future yet, because uh, everything's fully accomplished that it is done within Jesus, that Jesus accomplished all that needed to be fulfilled. Right. And when we, when we look back at uh, previous covenants that there's, they all have like a pointing towards Jesus, right. Even with the Abrahamic covenant, right. Um, you will be my people through you, uh, through your descendants, right. All the nations will be blessed. We see that Jesus fulfilled fills that um, within uh, the Mosaic Covenant, right? We got the laws. Uh, the law is like the the mediator or like the the means to which the people um, could attain righteousness if they completely obeyed it, right? But there was an inability, so they weren't able to. Jesus fulfills that though by being completely righteous and obeying it completely to show us that He's God. Like there's there's all covenants that that point towards yeah. uh, Jesus and find their fulfillment in Jesus. And then Jesus says, "It is finished." Not Hey, there's still things to come. Um, I definitely think that um, there's going to be, you know, a culmination of of everything when Jesus comes back, um, right, and fulfills everything and brings everything to fruition. But yeah, as far as new covenants now, it's fulfilled and it's accomplished. What? Um, so the old covenant and the new covenant are are different, and we're going to get into the new covenant. But how did someone? How did someone? get accepted. We mentioned circumcision, Mm -hmm. but how was someone saved Mm -hmm. under the old covenant? Mm -hmm. And do you think that there's a difference without really getting into what the new covenant is, but do you think that there's a difference between how someone was saved in the old covenant Mm -hmm. and how someone is saved in the new covenant? Yeah. So I believe God has always been saving by grace through faith, right? Um, I believe, yeah, that's always been the been the case. But within like their context, right, they have a covenant and the mediator, right? The the law is kind of the way that they enter into that. Now we have a new mediator, um, and who we go through to get access to God. But um, but yeah, with that, the with the old covenant, um, yeah, there was just a, it was just like for a particular time, and I believe that people who would express faith in God would be engrafted in. And if they were Gentiles or something like that, outside of the faith, they would have to get circumcised. We see um, Rahab, right? She's somebody who wasn't a part of the Jewish community. And then uh, she expressed faith in God and was grafted in. She's in the lineage of Jesus. Yeah. So so God was always saving by faith through grace. Um, though there was obedience that, that came with that, it wasn't necessarily there as like, that's how, that's how they got saved. God has always been saving by grace through faith. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Do you think so? There were sacrifices that were mm-hmm. made in the in the old covenant, um, and do, were people saved by those sacrifices? Do you believe they were saved by um, the shed blood of animals? So I believe that that was a pointing towards Jesus, right? That there was a, a faith that there to, that that was being expressed. Right. With that in a future atonement, a full atonement that was to go for, because, right, we read in Hebrews, right, that the blood uh, of bulls and goats couldn't atone for sins. Right. So it's a pointing towards Jesus. So, no, it didn't save um, because there wasn't the the full satisfactory atonement like Jesus provides. Yeah. Um, that it was a faith that, hey, God is going to provide atonement. And this is just a means in which he's using right now. Yeah. Thanks uh, for joining us, uh, Dinu. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to get into the the distinctions. If anyone is watching and has any questions, feel free to ask. We'd love to engage with you there. Um, If you're receiving value, like this video and subscribe to this channel. You know, some people, when when we're talking about like the Old Covenant, some people who maybe are kind of biblically illiterate or biblically ignorant and not in a jerk way, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I use that word kind of, you know, loosely, like not, not just ignorant in the fact that they don't know. Yeah. Some people tend to th- approach the Old Testament and the Old Covenant that, 
oh, because animal sacrifices happened, because um, there were stipulations in this covenant as far as obedience goes, if you don't obey, there's no blessing. If you mm-hmm. don't obey, you're cut off. Then that would imply that you're that you there was salvation by works. Mm-hmm. But you had mentioned that, no, it's, it's always been on the basis of faith and grace. Mm-hmm. So it's important to make that distinction that it's even in the Old Covenant, even though the Old Covenant is different than the New Covenant, that people were saved in the same way they're in the New Covenant. And Romans chapter 4 would validate that, um, that Abraham was justified by faith. Mm-hmm. And it's not on the basis of what he did in his obedience, but it's on the basis of faith. It's always been. And Rob had even brought up the um, Hebrews passage where, the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. That's mm-hmm. why in the old covenant, there has to be continual sacrifices, yeah. continual sacrifices over and over and over again. And you know, someone uh, reached out to me via Instagram, you know, gave me an Instagram question about my views of like Israel and the land and stuff. Mm-hmm. And how like, do does ethnic yeah, yeah, yeah. Israel, does ethnic Jews, does that land belong to them? Or does the land belong to Palestine? Jews believe it belongs to them. Um, and then there's that wailing wall where the temple was, mm-hmm. where the sacrifices were, for uh for you know to for atonement to to occur for the you to be at one with god and but but we don't have to worry about that in the new covenant we don't have to worry about the animal sacrifices in the new covenant but those but the the, but ethnic israel is hoping one day to get the land you know to own that land so that they can build a temple again so let's talk about the new covenant we're now going to talk about the new covenant what is the new covenant and what's the relationship Mm -hmm. between the old covenant and the new covenant Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with the with the old covenant, right? Um, there were stipulations with it that it was, hey, if you obey, you will be my people. I will be your God, right? And the people were constantly failing. Like if you read through the Old Testament, they were failing to um, uphold their their end of the bargain. Um, but even in the midst of that, God is still saving. Um, nevertheless, when we get to uh, when we get to the the kingdom era, right, where we got the kings coming through, we get prophets that start arising, and they start right. They're always trying to call them to obedience to to the old covenant. But they're they're failing, and then we get to you know Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and and they're mentioning, hey, there's going to be a new covenant, right? And this new covenant is going to be yeah one where we right. That's uh, good. Yeah, keep going. Where we, where we write laws, uh, where God is going to give His people a spirit, right, uh, to where they can obey. He's going to write the law um, on their minds and their hearts. So so there's testament to this new covenant that God is going to um, be closer, like with His people. So uh. yeah. So you mentioned that that there's a connection between the old covenant and the new covenant and you mentioned jeremiah i want to go to one go to jeremiah chapter 31 so we can look at that jeremiah 31 is a passage that is worth considering just get all the words there on the screen almost all the words almost almost we're almost there there we go, there we go. jeremiah 31 34 <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to get my face in it. There we go. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, you know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And then, and then you mentioned a little bit about uh, Jesus. And then it says Jesus, referring to Jesus, Hebrews 9, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the covenant. So in, in these verses continually talk about new covenant. So I want to talk a little bit more about the new covenant and I want to pr- provide some, my perspective. So old covenant had stipulations. Mm-hmm. New covenant has stipulations as well. Mm-hmm. What stipulations, what requirements are taken into the new covenant and which ones are not taken from the old covenant? Who's that? Vocab. Hey, Vocab. You want to come in and hang out? Sure. Well. Um, 
Maybe go and grab some, some, some vocab. <laughs> could you go grab a Could you go grab a chair from my kitchen? Yeah. Yeah. Go grab a chair hey, from my kitchen. Hey, yeah. yeah but, uh, vocab just popped in. Oh, um, what can you grab that pod mic? <laughs> Sorry, vocab just popped in, and then <laughs> and then oh, could you grab yeah, that I while I start? While I keep talking about the stipulations between the old and new covenant. So in the old covenant. We had the three categories of laws, and you had the ceremony, you had the, the civil and, um, civil or judicial, and then you had the moral law. So what's carried over into the new covenant? Well, Jesus comes, he fulfills the law, that's Matthew chapter 7. He didn't come to abolish it. He didn't come to uh, do away with, with the requirements of the law, but he's the fulfillment. So there is an element of the Old Testament laws are expiring, the Old Testament laws disappearing. Um, and then Rob, could you look, for, could you, there's also that mic wire down there too. You'll see it. So there's an element of the fact that they're, they're, they are there. Uh, there's an expiration on some of the old covenant laws that come into the, and come into the new covenant. And, um, so I wanted to look at, um, something that was said, what exactly changed in the new covenant? Why aren't we under the law? Thanks Isaac for, a, for asking, um, what exactly changed under the new covenant? Let me get this wire. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's all right. So what a surprise celebrity guest appearance. Yeah, right. I'm not the real YouTuber. Or the real pastor. Ooh. Oh, look. D-New, Isaac. Hey. Nice. <laughs> all right. You just plug that in, and then it's going yeah, to work. All right. Make sure you just speak into it, so you may want to move your books. Um, this is a nice yo, setup. How about you answer this question for us, Vocab? What exactly changed in the New Covenant? Everything. <laughs> Jesus. No, I mean, uh, you know, there's progressive covenants, right? So mm -hmm. this isn't the first time there's been a change. Mm -hmm. We'll sometimes say the old covenant, and that's basically right, you know, but the old covenant encapsulates these other little yeah. tinkerings, if you want to call them. But this is not a tinker. This is a total restructure. All those things that were explicitly pointed to in the old covenant, Jesus fulfills, and even the things that maybe we didn't think about or were more subtle, all those things he fulfills. And so it's, it's, it's radically different. So, you know, before... You're putting your faith in God, but for something that's going to happen, you know, my sins are taken away from the sacrifice because I trust what God is saying, but the, the blood's not really taking away the sin in, in a permanent sense. That's why you keep on doing it again, as Hebrew says. But now, after Jesus, now you're looking back, I trust what God has done here. I tr I'm trusting that that's what happened. So it's like, you know, so everything changes, hinges on Jesus, which... Which, uh, you know, that's the, the big difference. And that, that does mean there's uh, alterations. Whatever term you want to use, they're all alterations. Yeah. And they're things that are obsolete now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the other question was, why aren't we under the law? What proof texts are there? Um, why aren't we under the old? Like, is, in what sense are we under certain, why, certain laws in the Old Testament still apply? And what certain laws do not apply? Um, maybe you could delve into that as far as being under the law goes. Wow. We're all, we're all talking about, right? I'm not just, I'm not yeah. answering no, it. Right? No, no, but you, but you just came <laughs> I, in. I, I, yeah, no. well, I we've gotcha. been talking for like, uh, what, 20 minutes or yeah, so? Like well, that. you know, one place that I, uh, like that I, that think that's good for this is, uh, first Corinthians nine. And so listen to the way Paul speaks, though I am free and belong to no one. I have the NIV. I know you probably pulled the ESV which is fine. I've made myself a slave to everyone. So there's a freedom Paul has, but then he's, then, then he's in service. So that's good humility. It's a very Christ-like attitude to win as many as possible. So salvation matters because hell is real and so is heaven. Mm -hmm. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Now that's fascinating. Paul's a Jew. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it'd be like, imagine saying to the Mexicans, I became like a Mexican. Someone, <laughs> someone might be like, yeah, but aren't you over mm -hmm. So it's like, why does Paul say that? I don't think it's too much reading into it to almost see Paul seeing himself as part of what you might call a third race. If you have Jew, Gentile, Christian, mm 
Yeah. And notice this is not an ethnic national category like the other two. This is something new and distinct. Paul's not really saying he's not a Jew. I'm not saying that. But it's like it, it, he has a transcend a, tra- a category now that's transcendent past that. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. And by the way, that's only because of the new covenant. Mm-hmm. That's the only reason you would think that way. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. And then, this is important, to those under the law. So those guys under the law, implication, not under the law, not in the same way that an Old Testament Jew would be, because he says, I became like one under the law. Now, if that's not clear enough, look at the next line. Though I myself am not under the law. That's crazy. (laughs) Paul, now... Paul's not an antinomian. We've already seen Romans. He's right. not just lawless. He's not just doing whatever. Yeah, define antinomian since you just introduced that. Yeah, so namos is a Greek word that means yeah. law, and then, you know, anti is against something. So if you're antinomian, it means against the law. But it, it doesn't mean it in the sense of we're saying the law's been fulfilled or something like that. It means, like, where you uh, essentially can do whatever. It's like reckless. It's like reckless. Like, yeah, we can do this. We can do this. God will forgive. It's okay. Like the, almost like no moral restraints in a way, uh, but antinomians a slur. Sometimes you'll get. Sometimes people will use against you if you don't believe in works salvation. But it is a legitimate category that has popped up in church history where people really were antinomians. Mm-hmm. Sure, uh, Rob, you are teaching. You, you taught on Sunday, mm-hmm. preached on Sunday on Acts fifteen. You're teaching mm-hmm. tonight mm-hmm. on Acts fifteen, or leading us um, tonight in Acts fifteen. What's the issue? about the law, the Old mm-hmm. Covenant, and the relationship with the New Covenant in Acts 15. What's going on in Acts 15? Maybe you could speak to that. Yeah, yeah. So in Acts 15, you got these uh, people from Judea that are coming down to the church in Antioch and telling them that they need to be circumcised um, in order to be saved, right, to receive salvation. Um, and then you look further, and there's people who are saying that they need to be ordered to follow the law of Moses um, as, a, as a means, like, yeah, for salvation. And so with, with the term salvation, right, we're thinking um, being saved from, from God's wrath, right, that we're, you know, sinners condemned, um, you know, in our sin, but Jesus comes to save us from that wrath. And there's a means to how you obtain that. They're trying to say that it's through obedience to the law. And then so, so we have uh, Paul, right, and Barnabas push back on that, and then the, there comes the Jerusalem Council to think about that. And really what, what the pushback is is the fact that Jesus came uh, to save and it was his works that accomplished it alone. And so there, there's there's a pushback because when you dive into Paul's letters too, the law was never, um, the, the, the people were never able to achieve salvation through the law, that there was like a human inability, right? And because people write Romans 3 that uh, they fall short of the glory of God, that they sin. So people are incapable of fully obeying the law and therefore are under a curse and and can't and, and uh, uh, can't get to salvation. And so, so Paul, views that as a form of slavery that hey you're putting a yoke on these people you're putting a a form of slavery because now salvation has been manifested apart from the law through jesus and by faith and so it's definitely a lot of pushback because through jesus we get salvation by faith in his work alone right and here we got jews still trying to say that a means into this um is by obedience to the mosaic law do you uh do you still think that people tend to fall into this issue in Acts 15, do you think, how might you apply it that? Do you think it's applicable today, the issue that's going on in Acts 15? Yeah. Like it's over circumcision, but what do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. yeah we got, what, the Hebrews Roots movement. Uh, you got Hebrew Israelites. You got um, just, yeah, some Old Testament fanatics <laughs> that, that are out there that are still trying to uh, push that, whether they claim that they're a part of these, you know, camps, they still fall under that type of thinking that you have to obey salvation or or you have to uh, not obey salvation. You have to obey the Mosaic Law yeah. um, in order to enter into salvation or to maintain it to like keep it you know um so there's definitely that type of thinking going out today for sure and yeah yeah, x15 speaks to that if you're receiving value make sure you like this video and subscribe to this channel vocab i'm gonna go yeah no thanks yeah okay so yeah uh, sermon on the mount matthew 5 through 7 yeah blessed are blessed are blessed are blessed are so that's a sermon on the mount and then when you get to matthew 5 i think partially because jesus gave the sermon on the mount so it's like, well, hold on, let me reassure you guys, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not a hater of the Old Testament, you know, I'm not abolishing this in the, in the way you might be thinking. So let me show you what, what's really going on. What I'm telling you 
is not against. This is the fulfillment of because I am the fulfillment of, and that's why I came. And you look when you look at Matthew, he uses this word fulfill earlier in regards to some prophecies, but they're prophecies that aren't direct, explicit prophecies. Like Ma- Micah five two is pretty explicit about Messiah born in Bethlehem. Uh, there's other things though that uh, Matthew refers to specifically, like out of Egypt I have called my son. That's about Israel coming out of Egypt. But then Matthew says Jesus fulfills this. And it shows that there's these other ways to fulfill. And what it means and the way he uses it, and it's a Greek way that can be used, is to full to, to fill up to give it its full meaning. So the full intended meaning, Jesus is doing that with these passage. And so I think that's similar to what he's saying there. And it basically just the ultimate Thing of what it really means is to complete its intended purpose. So here was the law's purpose. Jesus is completing that. And that's what he's saying here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so um, he is articulating the, the final, the complete intention of, of the commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's important to understand because this is the heart of it all right here. This is the heart of it all. And so Jesus is not also saying, hey, I'm just doing the same old, same old. Because this is different, this is new, this is unique, but what he's saying is this was the point the whole time. So sometimes people try to misuse that to try to be like, look, Jesus is just basically renewing the covenant, or he's just he's just saying, look at this Old Testament, and that's it. But he's doing something more than that. And, you know, you get a good example where he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Some of those were corruptions of, of Old Testament regulations, but some yeah. of them were actually quotes from the law. Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, wait, how is he going to say that, you know? So that's important to understand. Mm-hmm. He's saying this is what it's really all about right mm-hmm. here. And he's the one who has authority to do it because just like Moses, you know, goes up a mountain and then speaks to the people when he comes down. Jesus is teaching on a hillside. This is all brought out when you look at the synoptics. Mm-hmm. He's sort of a new Moses giving new commands in a very real way. And that makes sense because with a new covenant Mm -hmm. come new stipulations, regulations Mm -hmm. for that covenant. And this is a new covenant. It is not merely a renewed covenant. That's a different word in Greek. And that's not the scripture that's implied in scripture. It's not just hitting reset on the, on the, on the game system. That's not all that's Mm -hmm. happening. Yeah. Um, Before we, we switch gears into uh, kind of doing some reviews, I wanted to ask um, you both, a pastoral and preaching type of question. Okay. This is good stuff. I think how might, so Leviticus 11 is dietary laws. And we would agree that all of us here who understand the new covenant, we would agree that the dietary laws no longer apply Mm -hmm. to us today, but how might you Rob, um, how might you preach on something like Leviticus chapter 11? Mm -hmm. How might you apply that to us today? And then you can add on. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, we understand that right. Jesus fulfills the law. Um, not everything within the law applies to us. Dietary laws, things of that nature. So you go. So with that, what I think the new covenant does is give us a new lens to to view the old covenant through, and specifically like through the lens yeah. of Jesus. That hey, did Jesus fulfill this? How does this point towards Jesus? Right. And when you look into the dietary laws, and you, and you start to see, um, yeah, we we get the ability to see the heart behind like why God gives these laws. What's the what was the purpose of these laws and um, studying that, we see that it was intended for them to be separate, to be distinct, right? To be a holy nation that that's different. So when if I'm teaching right within the dietary laws, I'm saying, hey, God used this uh, these laws here to make Israel His people distinct from the other nations to be a light um, to the world. So in what ways can you be, be distinct and refrain? What ways from, can you be set apart? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and uh, reflect God's light. So yeah, that's good. Do you want to add on to anything of that? Okay. Well, yeah, those food laws do keep separate. Uh, Israel from Gentiles because there's only so much you can do if you can't eat together. Mm-hmm. Imagine if you're at work with somebody and like, hey, want to take a break together? Sorry, I, I can't be around the food you're eating. It would be all, it wouldn't just be well, you can't eat together. You'd also be like, you know, it would, <laughs> but that was the, that was part of the intention to show Israel set apart and there's a barrier. And the reason I use barrier is because this is important. Filter I would filter Leviticus 11. You brought up through Ephesians 2:14, which says. He brought down the dividing wall of hostility Mm -hmm. that has been broken down in Christ. That's Ephesians 2, 14. So those regulations that kept Jews and Gentiles separate, that they've been torn down. I always picture the Berlin Wall in 1989, removing these pieces, people taking sledgehammers, 
it has been taken down. It is no longer there. So I don't know why you get people in love with temporary <laughs> regulations who want to keep on erecting it up. You know, yeah. they want to build the wall, but the wall's been torn down. Yeah, that's good stuff. It's from the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to go and have a Bible study of our own. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel if you receive value. And we will see you in another video.